Let us uh, now uh, take a look at uh, what we have learnt earlier um, and uh, revise it once again uh, for the sake of clarity. So, if you remember that we have talked about inelastic materials and plastic materials, uh, we have not made uh, a great deal of uh, distinction between the two, uh, but there is a subtle difference between inelastic and plastic materials. The inelastic materials do not exhibit a specific trend of deformation as a function of the applied force. So, in fact, they may not deform at all, uh, which I will give an example or the deformation caused could be partially recoverable or reversible uh, when the load or the force applied is being removed. So, however, the materials which are uh, permanently deformed even when the load is removed are called as plastic materials. Okay. So, what I wish to state is that, that all plastic materials are inelastic materials while all inelastic materials are not plastic materials. Let me uh, elaborate this statement a little more. Take an example of a steel rod, steel is a very well known material uh, and it has been discussed in the context of elasticity quite a bit. The steel rod remains rigid for low to moderate tensile forces. Farther increase of the forces uh, shows a linear elastic regime where Hooke's law is valid which I have told you earlier. While uh, if we increase the force or the load farther then beyond a certain value the material uh, breaks or the material fractures. So, uh, thus at low or moderate tensile forces steel behaves like an inelastic material, but this is not plastic distinguish it between a plastic material. Now, while at very large forces uh, when it breaks it demonstrates a plastic behavior. So, if we summarize this discussion of the distinction between inelastic materials and plastic materials, we could say that um, the, the plastic materials are the subsets of the inelastic materials. So, all plastic deformations are inelastic deformations where Hooke's law is not obeyed, but all inelastic deformations again for which the Hooke's law is not obeyed are, uh, are not uh, uh, plastic deformations. Let me also at the same time revisit um, the microscopic concept of elasticity, which could actually enhance your knowledge about elasticity and uh, uh, make you understand uh, the notion of elasticity which we have been talking about better. So, from the intermolecular and the interatomic forces perspective one can uh, understand the elastic behavior. Uh, take the short, uh, uh, short piece of metallic wire such as a straightened paper clip, you have seen those paper clips if you just open these uh, windings and straighten it up is what we are talking about as a short wire. So, if you try to stretch it along its length okay, and if the stretching forces are small the wire will not break. So, what happens at the atomic level is the following. So, one has uh, slightly increased the average distance r between the atoms which constitute this wire, this metal wire. Uh, and however, the attractive forces between the pairs of atoms is able to restore the tensile forces that is given by u. Okay. So, now 
just do the opposite that is apply a compressive force uh, or a compressive stress. So, you try to shorten um, the length of the uh, wire. So, uh, if you do that for again for uh, short compressive stresses, the repulsive forces between the pairs of atoms um, combats or it resists uh, the compressive stresses. So, the, the further observations will reveal that it is fairly difficult to compress a metal and so that the repulsive force must be really very large. So, that uh, so that one uh, uh, even for uh, you know small distances between the atoms. Okay. Secondly, once a metal is broken by large tensile stresses or compressive stresses given to them, they cannot be joined together. So, even for a distance as small as a millimeter or even a fraction of a millimeter, the attractive forces are, um, um, are, are effectively negligible or they are nearly 0. So, let me now uh, do a dimensional analysis of uh, the Young's modulus uh, to make you understand it better. Um, we go back to this uh, very fam familiar uh, equation which is uh, y equal to f by a uh, divided by delta L over L 0. To remind you, uh, you have seen this expression a number of times, uh, y is the Young's modulus, um, f is the force or the load that is given to the material in order to cause uh, either stretching or compression, a is the area of cross section of the material, delta L is the change in length and L 0 is the original length of the material. Uh, so, this is truly written as stress over strain. And just to remind you that this stress could be uh, compressive stress or it could be tensile stress. So, in any case uh, you have uh, the stress which is the force over area given by m l t minus 2. Uh, the reason being that the force is always written as a mass into the acceleration. So, this is mass and this is the acceleration which is distance um, divided by uh, time square or velocity divided by time. And A goes as which is the area of cross section goes as L square and the strain is dimensionless. So, I am just simply writing a 1 there. So, the whole thing is actually uh, Newton is the unit for the force and divided by uh, the S i unit for area is meter square. So, y has the unit Newton per meter square. I shall list out uh, some of the materials uh, which are used uh, in uh, day to day life. Uh, also, they are uh, used as construction materials. Um, I will uh, um, write down their maximum allowable uh, uh, the stresses um, and the compressive stresses and the shear stresses. So, to begin with, uh, so let us just make this table. So, we have a material and then we have tensile uh, strength. Newton per meter square, compressive Newton per meter square and shear strength again in Newton per meter square. So, iron 
it's 170 into 10 to the power 6, 550 into 10 to the power 6, 170 into 10 to the power 6, steel, um, Five hundred into ten to the power six, uh, five hundred into ten to the power six, two fifty into ten to the power six, brick ten to the power six. Um, this is 35 into 10 to the power 6, um, 4 concrete uh, which is 2 into 10 to the power 6, 20 into 10 to the power 6, 2 into 10 to the power 6. Two hundred into ten to the power six, two hundred into ten to the power six, two hundred into ten to the power six, and we have wood, uh, pine wood, which is. Um, 40 into 10 to the power 6, 35 into 10 to the power um, 6 and 5 into 10 to the power 6. So, these are the maximum allowable stresses for each of these materials. Uh, so, we uh, were talking about the strength of materials. Uh, I have listed uh, some of the materials uh, um, which are very familiar to us and um, we have seen that uh, if the stress on a certain object is too large, uh, it will uh, cause uh, either permanent damage or it will cause a fracture and make the material to break. Uh, some of these uh, materials which are listed on the left are uh, very familiar to all of you. They are used as building materials. They are iron, steel, brick, concrete, aluminum, wood, especially pine wood. And we have listed the maximum tensile strength, um, maximum compressive strength and maximum shear strength all in a Newton per meter square. And if one is making a structure uh, with any of these materials such as iron, steel, brick, concrete, aluminum or wood, uh, one should never um, cross these numbers. And in principle while uh, making structures, there should be uh, something like 10 percent of these numbers um, and uh, should not exceed more than that in any case. So, just to uh, bring to your attention uh, that uh, um, iron has uh, the tensile strength to be reasonably large which is 170 into 10 to the power 6, whereas the compressive strength uh, is uh, more than 3 times of that and the shear strength is uh, again 117 to 10 to the power 6. Similarly, the steel has uh, tensile strength and compressive strength and shear strength to be much larger, whereas brick has a small tensile strength. and uh, reasonably large compressive strength um, and that is why uh, <coughs> um, uh, so brick is good under compression, uh, but it is not when it is uh, exerted to tension. And similarly, a concrete also uh, is used uh, for uh, pillars or vertical columns um, because the compressive strength maximum compressive strength is. Uh, about 20 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square, uh, whereas the tensile strength is uh, 
small which is 2 into 10 to the power 6 uh, meter uh, Newton per meter square. Um, so, uh, when one uses them in buildings, they use reinforced concretes in which um, the iron rods are inserted into the concrete structure and which perform much stronger uh, than without them and then it is good for the stability. Here you can see a beam that has been acted upon by a force at the middle which is like a compressive strength that is uh, given to the beam and the beam uh, uh, shows a deformation um, in the middle and these kind of deformations are to be kept in mind while building structures. So, uh, now let us discuss uh, another thing which is um, very uh, uh, important from the uh, experiment point of view that is experimental determination of Young's modulus. So, here uh, we wish to uh, understand that how uh, experimental determination of Young's modulus uh, for a material of a wire uh, can be determined. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the picture there are two wires A and B, A is called the reference wire and B is the experimental wire for which we uh, need to know the Young's modulus. Um, so, there is a scale system as a measuring device uh, which consists of a main scale and a vernier scale. Uh, initially both these wires uh, are uh, given some small but finite weight so that uh, they are um, elongated and straight. Uh, both these wires have uh, same area of cross section and length. Um, <coughs> so, the initially the meter reading is noted when the weight in both these wires the reference wire and the experimental wires are same and then the experimental wire is loaded with some more weights which causes an elongation and again the reading is noted. The difference between the two vernier scales that is when they are equal weights as compared to when they are unequal weights are the difference between that is taken as the elongation. So, let us assume that the initial radius uh, the radius of both the wires is equal to R 0 and initial length is equal to L 0. So, uh, elongation due to the weights it is equal to delta L and suppose mass causing the elongation is equal to M. So, the Young's modulus can be written as so it is M G over pi r 0 square. So, this is the stress divided by the strain. Okay. So, since all these quantities such as m r 0 delta l and l 0 all are quantities that we know for using this formula we can find out the Young's modulus of the experimental value. So, uh, now we shall uh, talk about some examples uh, to what we have learned so far and let us uh, have two plots uh, which depict stress versus strain for two materials, two different materials. Um, and they look like this. So, let us call the plots as A and B. So, these are stress versus strain characters for two uh, materials say two wires and uh, they look like this. The question is that one which material has 
larger Young's modulus. Second is which of the two is a stronger material. And the answer would be B in both the cases and let us try to understand why that is the uh, case. Uh, the Young's modulus Y is defined as the ratio of stress to strain. So, it is this versus this. Okay. Uh, since B has a steeper slope as compared to A, so B has larger Young's modulus and A has smaller Young's modulus. And to answer uh, the question, second question that is which one of them denotes a stronger material? Again the answer would be B. The reason is that, that to cause the same strain, you need bigger stress uh, for B. So, to cause a strain of uh, this much, uh, a stress of this is required. However, to cause a strain of again the same amount, uh, a much larger stress is required. So, uh, strength uh, this uh, B material has more strength as compared to the A material. So, here uh, in the next example, let us compute the bulk modulus of water from the data that is given. So, the initial volume of water is given as 100 liters. Uh, the pressure increase is given by uh, delta P which is equal to 100 atmospheres. And just to let you know that 1 atmosphere is equal to 1.013 into 10 to the power 5 Pascals and uh, 1 Pascal is equal to 1 Newton per meter square. So, if you uh, need to calculate the uh, bulk modulus from this data, so bulk modulus is given by uh, your delta P uh, divided by delta V divided by V i and delta V is V f minus V i which is equal to 0.5 liter. So, if you put in all these things which are 100 atmosphere which is equal to this Pascals and um, into 100 liters divided by 0.5 liters, then this thing comes out to be equal to <coughs> 2.026 into 10 to the power 9 Pascals which is equal to uh, 2.026 into 10 to the power 9 meter per uh, Newton per meter square. So, uh, the question is that why uh, do uh, water. So, water seem to be having a large bulk modulus. In fact, the gases have more bulk modulus because they are compressible. So, uh, more the compressible the fluid is uh, more bulk modulus it will have. So, the bulk modulus from the data is given by um, delta V over V i which is equal to delta P into V i divided by delta V and this is 100 atmosphere 1.013 into 10 to the power 9 um, 10 to the power excuse me 10 to the power 5 Pascals into 100 liters divided by 0 0.05 liter. So, this will come in Pascals 
and which is equal to 2.026 into 10 to the power 9 pascals which is equal to 2.026 into 10 to the power 9 Newton per meter square. So, this is the bulk modulus of water uh, for a pressure given to be of 100 atmosphere when the liquid has expanded from 100 liters to 100.5 liters. So, as a third example, let us see the again the computation of bulk modulus. Now, not for a liquid but for a solid copper cube which is uh, 10 centimeters of edge and it is subjected to a pressure hydraulic pressure of uh, 7.0 into 10 to the power 6 Pascal uh, and given that the bulk modulus of copper solid copper is uh, 140 into 10 to the power 9 Newton per meter square. So, we again uh, use this formula as delta P divided by delta V over V i. Do not forget to convert your V i's which are in 10 centimeters whole cube or this is equal to 0.1 meter whole cube which is equal to 0 0.001 meter cube and <coughs> your um, uh, delta V is what is wanted. So, uh, delta V divided by V i becomes equal to a delta P divided by P and this V i can go upstairs uh, for you to compute delta V which is a change in volume of the solid copper cube uh, and uh, this can be uh, when you put in all these values delta P is uh, 7 into 10 to the power 6 pascals. Um, this is 140 into 10 to the power 9 uh, Newton per meter square and uh, this is equal to 0 0.001 meter cube and this is almost equal to 0 0.5 um, into 10 to the power minus 6 meter cube. So, that is the change in uh, volume uh, that you will have for a solid copper cube when it is subjected to a hydraulic pressure of uh, 7 into 10 to the power 6 Pascals. So, let me uh, write down a problem. Uh, <coughs> so, there are two wires uh, each of diameter Uh, 0 0.25 centimeter, uh, one made of steel and the other and the other of brass. as shown below I will just show the diagram in a moment. Um, the unloaded length of the steel wire is 1.5 meter uh, and that of the brass wire is 1 meter. Compute the elongations of the steel.
steel and brass wires. Um, given Y steel equal to 20 into 10 to the power 10 Newton per meter square uh, and brass 9 into 10 to the power 10 Newton per meter square. So, the diagram is So, uh, <clears throat> the loads uh, that are uh, these are subjected to um, is uh, steel, uh, the steel wire is subjected to a load of 4 kgs and the brass wire is subjected to a load of uh, 6 kgs um, and uh, you need to calculate the elongations of the steel and the brass wires. So, let us do this problem. Uh, so, there is a, a rigid support here, there is a steel rod which is uh, loaded with a uh, weight 4 kg. So, this is steel um, and uh, this is 1.5 meter long, uh, there is a 1 meter long uh, brass wire which is loaded with a 6 kg, this is brass and this is uh, 1 meter. Uh, the diameter of both are 0.25 centimeter which is equal to 25 into 10 to the power minus 4 meter. Uh, y of steel is equal to 20 into 10 to the power 10 Newton per meter square y for brass uh, to be 9 into 10 to the power 9 Newton per meter square. So, we shall use this formula which is uh, well known to us, it is stress uh, divided by the strain which is uh, this. So, the extensions are going to be computed as F into L 0 divided by A into Y and hence uh, for steel. So, the uh, extension in steel let us call it delta L steel that is going to be uh, uh, now there are two weights acting on the steel wire which is 4 kg and 6 kg assuming uh, the wires are uh, massless. So, you have uh, 10 kg of weight being supported by the steel wire. So, this will be like uh, 10 kg and taken g to be taken as 10 meters per second square it will be 100 Newton uh, and 1.5 meter is the length uh, divided by uh, pi into 25 uh, uh, square into 10 to the power minus 8 uh, into 4 uh, and the y to be given as 20 into 10 to the power 10 uh, and this will be in meter. If you do this simplification, this comes out to be uh, 1 into 10 to the power minus 4 uh, meter. Uh, whereas, the same thing done for the brass, 
uh, we have a delta L brass and now the weight that the brass wire supports is uh, 6 kg. So, it will be 60 Newton uh, into 1 uh, divided by pi and 25 square 10 to the power minus 8 into 4. Now, uh, the brass uh, of uh, has a Young's modulus which is 9 into 10 to the power 9. Uh, I am sorry, this is 9 into 10 to the power 10. So, this will be 9 into 10 to the power 10. And if you simplify this, uh, this comes out to be uh, 1.35 into 10 to the power minus 4 uh, meter. Uh, thus, uh, the brass wire has a little more expansion uh, than uh, the steel wire. Uh, the steel wire even though it is loaded with a larger uh, weight, uh, it still is uh, more, uh, it is more difficult to cause elongation in the steel wire as compared to the brass wire. Let us do a problem on uh, Young's modulus um, elastic properties of matter. Now, let us talk about a titanium alloy. So, a cylindrical specimen of a titanium alloy having an elastic modulus of 108 giga Pascal. As we have uh, told you many times that uh, the uh, elastic modulus or the Young's modulus uh, in uh, practical units um, is represented uh, by this Pascal or giga Pascal, uh, whereas uh, we know that 1 Pascal equal to 1 Newton per meter square. So, uh, so this uh, and an original diameter of 3.9 millimeter will experience only elastic deformation when a tensile load two thousand Newton is applied. compute the maximum length of the specimen before deformation. If the maximum allowable elongation is is zero point four two millimeter. So, a uh, titanium alloy is given um, 
the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus, uh, which means the same thing in this case. Uh, is given uh, and also the original diameter is given, um, it is experiencing only an elastic deformation which means we are uh, fully in the elastic limit, when a tensile load of 2000 Newton is applied. So, compute the maximum length of the specimen before it starts deforming uh, and it is given that the maximum uh, elongation is 0.42 millimeter. Okay. So, to solve this the initial area of the cylinder is a 0 pi d 0 by 2 square, where d 0 is the initial diameter which is given as 3.9 millimeter. So, d 0 equal to uh, 3.9 millimeter. So, now the original length Um, is related to the deformation, uh, let us call this original length to be uh, say L 0, which is related to the deformation by this simple formula, where delta L is the elongation, which is given the maximum elongation is given, uh, the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus is given uh, and the tensile load is given to be 2000. Newton uh, A 0 is given. So, now we can put everything here and calculate. So, this is my elongation, this is my um, Young's modulus, then there is a pi and then there is a 3.9 into 10 to the power minus 3, there is a square there uh, <coughs> divided by 4 into 2000 Newton. So, this 4 is coming because there is a d 0 square by 4 and if you calculate that this becomes 0 0.257 meters which is equal to 257 millimeter. So, this is the maximum length of the specimen before it starts deforming. So, having uh, understood a number of uh, things about elasticity so far um, and also uh, that we have discussed plastic behavior and plasticity uh, and the difference therein with inelastic materials. Uh, Let us now look at certain uh, quantities uh, or rather certain terms which are of importance uh, not only in the context of physics or the mechanical properties of solids, but uh, in the context of your daily life or even in the context of chemistry that you would see uh, and uh, which are also about the properties of matter and we have not discussed them very explicitly. Uh, a number of things such as, uh, let us just list them out, uh, one it is called as uh, toughness, uh, two it is brittleness, uh, three it is hardness, Four, say for example, resilience, and maybe five as stiffness. You may have heard these terms that appear on the board uh, in the context of something else, and also in the context of properties of matter. Uh, 
let us now uh, try to uh, give a formal definition to it, so that you understand it better and uh, what uh, they have got to do with the modulus of elasticity and so on. Okay. Uh, so, let us just talk about uh, start with this toughness that we have uh, written it there uh, and let us define toughness. So, it is the uh, ability of a material to absorb energy to absorb energy and plastically deform without rupturing. So, uh, here it goes, uh, it is the ability, toughness is the ability of a solid material uh, to absorb energy and uh, deform uh, in an inelastic or a plastic manner uh, without breaking apart or without rupturing. So, it is actually the, um, the amount of energy per unit volume uh, that a material can be subjected to before it ruptures or before it breaks apart. Um, the examples uh, can be given in the following fashion that you see materials like ceramics which have uh, small toughness, uh, which means that uh, they actually break apart um, when uh, they are subjected to a tensile or a compressive stress. Um, so, even then they are very strong materials. So, the ceramics are actually strong materials where the low on toughness whereas, rubber is actually a tough material, but it is weak in terms of its strength. Okay? So, uh, we give examples of uh, uh, ceramics as having low toughness, whereas, rubber to be having a high toughness. Uh, Let us go to this second uh, quantity called as brittleness. So, this you may have heard of uh, when uh, you have uh, talked about materials in chemistry. So, a material is called as brittle uh, when it is uh, it breaks when it is subjected to a stress. And, uh, so, without undergoing any kind of significant deformation. So, it just breaks. So, it is, uh, so it breaks uh, being subjected to stress without undergoing significant deformation under strain. So, uh, technically speaking, they absorb a very small amount of energy uh, prior to fracture uh, and uh, even when they have very high strengths. So, ceramics and glasses for example, uh, they do not deform uh, plastically uh, and uh, they actually break very easily under stress. So, they are known as brittle materials. In fact, some of the polymers such as polystyrene uh, they are also uh, known as brittle materials and even uh, steel which is known to be quite tough uh, at very low temperatures uh, can become a brittle material. 
similarly, uh, if you have gone to these uh, shows where they um, show the utility and uh, uh, various things with liquid nitrogen, uh, you might have seen that they actually dip their hands inside the jar containing liquid nitrogen, uh, but they wear uh, sort of gloves in order to put their hands in. And the reason is that the bones uh, become extremely brittle uh, at that temperature. The liquid nitrogen temperature, which is uh, actually the boiling point of nitrogen is about 77 Kelvin. So, uh, it is not advisable to touch uh, liquid nitrogen by uh, bare hand. Let us talk about the third quantity, which uh, <coughs> we have listed down such as hardness. So, hardness is the measure of how resistant a solid is uh, to a permanent shape change when an applied force is given. Uh, so, there are uh, different kind of uh, hardnesses uh, such as scratch hardness, indentation hardness, etcetera. So, it is um, the property which says that uh, <coughs> or rather it is a measure uh, of how resistant a material is to a permanent shape change when subjected to a subjected to an applied force. So, uh, glass materials uh, have uh, a lot of uh, hardness uh, as compared to soft materials such as uh, copper or aluminum. So, let us uh, look at the next property called as uh, resilience. So, it is a capacity of the material to absorb energy when it is uh, elastically deformed and then uh, when the inner energy is released uh, upon unloading. Okay. Uh, so, resilience is the capacity of a material to absorb energy when it is deformed elastically. And then the energy which it has absorbed is released released upon unloading so uh, once it absorbs energy when it's loaded and after that when it's unloaded that is the load is taken off uh, then it releases energy and uh, it is obtained from the area of the stress versus strain graph. So, let us take a typical stress versus strain graph. So, 
So, till this is the elastic limit. So, let us call this strain as delta x elastic and this is the stress which is uh, equal to f over a. Uh, let us just uh, denote it by sigma. So, the area under this curve till the elastic limit is called as the resilience. So, what is uh, so the energy that is absorbed and hence released upon unloading is given by uh, sigma which is the stress and a d x from 0 to delta x elastic and now uh, because this will give the area of this. So, this is my um, value of sigma here. So, this has to be taken half of it because we are only talking about the area of a triangle and not the area of the whole uh, rectangle that appears here. So, this is equal to uh, half f over a um, and a d x from 0 to delta x elastic which is equal to uh, half uh, uh, f by a into delta x elastic. <coughs> so, that is the uh, u resilience. So, uh, this is the energy stored um, and hence released upon unloading for which measures the resilience of a given body. Now, let us look at the last one uh, which is the toughness uh, rather stiffness sorry not toughness it is stiffness. Toughness we have already talked about uh, which is what we have begun our discussion with. Uh, so, stiffness is defined as the ratio of the of the steady force acting on an elastic body to the resulting displacement. So, it is the ratio of the, the force that is applied to the body and the displacement that occurs due to the applied force. Uh, so, as such a stiffer material has a higher uh, stiffness, has a higher uh, elastic modulus, I am sorry, elastic modulus. So, stiffness is a measure of uh, uh, or rather the elastic modulus is a measure of stiffness, the higher the uh, elastic modulus higher is the stiffness. So, having uh, learnt about the elastic properties of matter, uh, we shall consider now the effects of temperature which we have missed out so far. And as we know that temperature plays a very important role in everyday life. Uh, so, it will play also an important role 
while discussing the elastic properties of matter. So, because of temperature the stress that is developed it is called as a thermal stress and so we shall uh, discuss thermal stress in next day's class and uh, we shall also talk about uh, the elasticity of different components of human body uh, and how uh, they are different than the solids uh, that we have discussed so far.